السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. My brothers and sisters, this is our second lesson on a new topic, the series of the heroes of Islam, the rightly guided caliphs, the rightly guided khalifas. The topic, my dear brothers and sisters, is that, and our focus is on the four rightly guided caliphs: Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, and also on the fifth. Caliph named Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, according to the majority of the scholars. Tonight, insha'Allah, we will be talking about the first part of the life of the first Khalifa of Islam, the remarkable, the great, the amazing, only second best to the Prophet Muhammad sallam, and his best friend and companion in life, Abu Bakr as Siddiq. His name was Abdullah ibn Abi Quhafa radiallahu anhu. And <clears throat> last week we began an introduction to the history of the Khalifa system. And just very quickly, last week what did we cover? I explained why there is a need to talk about this topic. Secondly, I gave a brief introduction to the history of the caliphate states starting throughout time from the first Khalifa Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu to Umar, Uthman and Ali and then it became hereditary family uh, inheriting from family the, the caliph the caliphate and then it slowly declined till the fall of the Ottoman caliphate empire on the 3rd of March 1924 over 1,300 years. For those who missed out on last class, you can find it, inshallah, on the Preston Mosque, Umar ibn Khattab uh, website or Facebook page to have a recap, even though today we'll give a very brief recap as well. I also defined what a caliph means and what a caliphate means, a khilafah system. And I'll repeat that briefly today too. In last week's talk, I also spoke about my sources, which I used to bring to you the contents of this topic today, alhamdulillah. Obviously, I don't talk it from my head, and it is a difficult topic to sift through to bring you authentic information about the history. Just very quickly, most of my information comes from the source al Bidaya wa Nihaya, the beginning and the end by the great Imam Ibn Kathir. Go back to last class and, I, and explains why I chose this, among other sources. I also gave another source for you if you want to know about the uh, Middle Ages, the Islamic uh, Khilafah and Islamic State. Uh, the Islam Muslim state of, under Islamic state in the Middle Ages. Uh, Insha'Allah, it's called Islamic Legacy, and you can get this podcast online, Insha'Allah. Also, I spoke a little bit of the, in the I, I gave an introduction. I gave an introduction about the uh, life of Abu Bakr as Siddiq, radiallahu anhu. I also explained why he was called as Siddiq, the one who believed the Prophet before anyone else. His title, I spoke about his lineage and his father and his family and his childhood and how close he was to the Prophet ﷺ. I also spoke about his character and his features. We gave a few stories about uh, his, just different stories from here and there, his interaction with Umar anhu and how his relationship was with him and how Abu Bakr anhu's opinions were always very close to the opinions of the Prophet ﷺ, and how he and Umar always most often disagreed on opinions other than Islam, to the point where the Prophet ﷺ used to say, if Abu Bakr and Umar, you too, agreed on something, don't even ask me, because it has to be right. So we spoke about them too, and gave about uh, both of them, and we gave some little tiny interesting stories that moved our hearts, and some of them were funny, and some of them teach us about the art of disagreement between two people who love one another, and also the art of disagreement between people who are in conflict. And today, inshallah, I will talk about the life of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu before he was elected as the first Khalifa, the whole time with in the life of Muhammad ﷺ, his life with the Prophet, peace be upon him, before his death, before the Prophet, peace be upon him's death. I need to recap a little bit for those who are newcomers today, inshallah. My first question that we need, the first question we need to ask is, what is a caliph? What is a khalifa? For those of you who missed out. 
A Khalifa rules under the state of a caliphate. What is a caliphate? A caliphate is an Islamic state. It's an Islamic state under which people live. You live in Australia, there are laws. You live in the UK, there are laws. You live in the United States, there are laws. You live under an emperor, there are laws. You live under a kingdom, there is a king. And in Islam, we also have something called the Islamic State under which a caliph represents us. What is a caliph? It's like any state in the world. There needs to be a general leader, a general leader under which everyone sits or uh, lives by. He is the caliph. And the caliph rules in accordance with, the, with Islam, the sharia, the Quran and the sunnah. He is under God. He doesn't make up rules of his own. And the caliph is elected by the Muslim. Uh, caliph is the elected Muslim religious and political leader of an Islamic state and represents the entire Islamic empire. He takes the role of the successor of chains of successors after the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and is under God, as we said, who rules by the Sharia, the Quran and the Sunnah. An Islamic empire is basically means the different countries and states under the, killer, the caliphate state. Each country or state uh, may have its own governance it may have its own leader, like a sultan or a governor, but they all answer to the khalifa, the caliph, like an umbrella. He is not an emperor, like the Chinese emperor or the Roman emperor. He is not like the president of a country. He is not a king. He is not a patriarch or a prophet nor is he a judge. He is responsible for the affairs, the rights, and protection of all the Muslims, of all the Muslim lands, its territories, and responsible for all the Muslims living under this empire. And he rules strictly by Allah's laws, the Islamic Sharia, which falls under five objectives. What is the Islamic Sharia? Falls under five objectives. The Sharia's role and the whole reason why Allah made the Sharia of Islam is for the following five reasons. Anyone who asks you, what's your Sharia law? I just said it in an accent because we live in Australia, so we always get the Sharia law. They think it's some weird alien type of system, but they don't know that it ruled for 1,300 years in peace and harmony and many non-Muslims lived under it and they advanced and they were productive and mashallah they spread it was beautiful well majority it, it was it was a workable system it wasn't all beautiful there were times that were not so good but what is the role of the sharia protection of life protection of life secondly protection of property that's the role of the sharia number three the sharia's role is protection of dignity and honor for all people your dignity and honor has to be protected under sharia Number four, protection of the mind and the intellect. That's the role of the sharia. And also the role of the sharia, protection of religion. Everybody has, nobody is, is, is forced to enter into Islam. No one is forced to go out of a religion. And also protects the rights of religion of Islam, number one. The objectives of sharia, my dear brothers and sisters, is a whole topic. And inshallah, maybe one day we can talk about it. But the khalifa and the caliphate system rules under these five objectives. And everything other than that is governing the land and people living and working and going and coming and being protected in a safe place, men and women having their rights and so on and so forth. The second question before I talk about Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. How, and this is what brothers asked me last week, I didn't want to go too much into it, but they asked me, why didn't I didn't want to go too much into it? Because I just want to talk about what benefits us now, you know, us here in Australia and around the world, but they asked me, how is the Muslim leader, the Muslim caliph elected? What's the criteria? How do we elect a khalifa? How did it always happen? So I'll just sum it up, sum it up inshallah for you. Always remember, there are three essential conditions. How many? Three. Three essential conditions before a khalif or a caliphate state can happen. Number one, 
There first needs to be a land or a country from where the caliphate system starts. Number two, you need a rightful person qualified to be that khalifa. And number three, you need the right people to choose that khalifa. So these are three conditions. As for the land or country from which the caliphate will start, it has to be a strong, protected, able to, yani, protect means able to protect itself. It has to be, it has to be stable, its economy, its people, its politics has to be stable, its leadership. It has to be legitimately governed. It cannot just have a group entering into a land and taking it by force, for example, and then saying we want to make the caliphate. That's not a land from which you can base the khalifa on. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the person. That person who can be the khalifa has to be, number one, a Muslim. A proper, legitimate Muslim that follows the correct sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Number two, he has to be sane, not mentally ill. Number three, he has to be healthy, body-wise, emotionally, mentally. Thirdly, he has to be a man. He has to be a man. Why? It's a long topic. But because of the situation and the role that he has, there are certain things that a woman cannot fulfill properly and comfortably if she was the Khalifa. Such as the mixing between men in a close proximity and being out with them in times of war or battle, a woman may not be able to fulfill that because of her, she has other roles. So it has to be a man. He has to be a scholar. He has to be learned in the deen of a high caliber of knowledge. He has to have strength in character where everybody respects him. He must have bravery. He's not, he's not afraid. He has to have great decision-making skills and a strong leadership skill. And he has to have emotional intelligence of a higher order. His emotions don't overcome him. He must be fair and just, known for his fairness, his justice, and his trustworthiness. And he has to be, well, he should be of the Quraysh, Quraysh lineage. He has to have a lineage that goes back to the tribe of Quraysh from which the Prophet ﷺ belongs to. I'm not saying the bloodline of the Prophet ﷺ, the Quraysh, meaning the tribe of the Prophet, peace be upon him. However, that Quraysh, there's a difference of opinion among the scholars in its understanding. I can tell you that the majority of scholars agree that if he can, if you can find a person who goes back to the Quraysh lineage, then, and he has all the other qualities, then good. But if it is hard to find him, or, it, or, or he may be found, but is not qualified, he doesn't have the qualities of being a Khalifa, then we don't choose him just because of the fact that he has the Quraysh bloodline. Rather, what benefits and suits the Muslim in the right time, in the right way. And that is what really matters, my dear brothers and sisters doesn't really have to be a Quraysh, but if he is and he has the qualities, then he takes priority. Is that understood? So now we've dealt with the type of person that has to be the Khalifa. We've still got a third problem, and that is the people who have to elect him. What kind of people are they? Anybody? Can he just get up and elect himself and say, I want to be the Khalifa because there is a gap in Islam? Can they just be a little group on the side and call themselves, we are the rightly guided people, we are the people God said we're... Where the people go into paradise, we're the chosen sect of all Islam, and we have the right self-appointed and say we are the ones? No. The people who elect him has to be a shura council, number one. So it's a council of people who delegate between each other and they vote on the khalifa. They are a large group, an authoritative committee of representatives, elected and chosen by the majority mainstream Muslims of the world. This large committee of representatives must be trusted, God-fearing, scholars, they have to be learned and scholars in Islam, highly intelligent on worldly affairs, powerful decision-making abilities, and united in purpose and methodology. In, Arab, in, in the Sharia terms, we call them Ahlul Halli wal Aqad. Ahlul Halli wal Aqad. They discuss and vote on the Khalifa. 
These people cannot be in a state of war. They can't be fighting and then say, we're going to make a Khalifa and then electing him. It cannot be an individual or a small operating al group operating alone, like what we said before. Now I ask you, my dear brothers and sisters, is it possible, based on these three criterias, is it possible in our current state in the world, the Muslim current state, to have a Khalifa? Yani, <laughs> we have several problems. Are the Muslims united on purpose and cause? Yani, we have so many Muslims now that claim that they are the ones and no one else is. We have Muslims making takfir on other Muslims. We may have Muslims who say, no, we are it and they are way off the track. There are Muslims who follow particular leaders and sheikhs and they say, no other sheikh is right. Yani, the Muslims are in turmoil at the moment, aren't we? There are those who call themselves modernist, uh, progressive Muslims, and they think they're on the right path. And you've got the other Muslims who are, I don't know what they're called, and liberists, and I don't know what other sects, and those who are, oh my God. And if you think that this is so easy, I don't know where you're, where you're living. If you're living really you're in society or living on some um, you know, isolated hill somewhere. And then we have the scholars. Yani, are the scholars united on purpose and opinions? Even the scholars themselves are divided. So, my dear brothers and sisters, do we have a Muslim land that has a stronghold, is stable and established and legitimately and harmoniously governed by Islamic law as it was in Islamic history? So, my dear brothers and sisters, the process to a Khalifa is not simple. It is a gradual process. Yeah, and I say Allahu A'lam, in my opinion, if the Khalifa was to be chosen right now, I think he wouldn't last one week. I think one week he'll be gone, wiped out. Looking at our state, this is my opinion. على كل حال, by uh, at any rate, what we have to focus on, my dear brothers and sisters, right now is us individually within our families and within our communities. Work on yourself and build your Islamic identity and your character. Practice Islam well. Avoid cheating. Avoid lying. Stick to your contracts. Stick to your promises. Fulfill your duty as a Muslim first and build yourself with sincerity and honesty. Be around your family and try to teach your family and uh, practice your deen within your family to the best of your ability. Share with the community. Help your community. Be honest in your trade. Be honest in your work. Right? Yeah, and these, these things that we can do right now, insha'Allah ta'ala. Some people ask me, who were the best caliphs in history? This is a big question. Ya akhi, I remember the Prophet there's a hadith from Prophet Sallallahu which is in Al-Bukhari and Muslim, number 7222 and number 1821. Some people, they say, why don't you state the source? If we keep stating sources by numbers, brothers and sisters, it'll be the whole lecture. So we'll just state that, inshallah. This matter, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi said, this matter will not end until there have been among them 12 caliphs. Then he said, all of them will be from Quraysh. In another hadith he says, Islam will continue to prevail through 12 caliphs. There are many opinions among the scholars about this hadith. Who are these 12 caliphs? Are they after each other? Are they separated? Who are they? What are their names? Honestly, the scholars have not united on that. On that. But what is definite that they have united on is the first four caliphs, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. And the majority scholars say Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, that's five. As for the rest, they have differed on. But what they do know for sure is that there is one more man who is about to come out, the Prophet wasallam has talked so much about, whom he called the Mahdi. The Mahdi, the chosen one, who will come to be the last Khalifa, ruler and leader of the Muslims. And the Prophet wasallam said, he will fill the world with justice as it was filled with oppression. And he will change the state of the Muslim world from what it is in turmoil to harmony and peace. He is Al-Imam Al-Mahdi. Or just the Mahdi. So my brothers and sisters in Islam, this is what is pending. Let us now begin about the life of who? Can you still remember after all that? <laughs> who? Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiyallahu anhu. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They are our heroes. In fact, for the young ones here, I had a young boy ask me, he did a little school assignment and said, how did you find religion and Islam? What, what motivated you? And I'll share this with you, subhanAllah, personally. When I was little, seven, eight years old, may Allah reward my father, he took it upon himself to make sure to learn about his religion. And he would tell me the stories of the companions, the men and women around the Prophet wasallam. He would tell us the stories in such a way that inspired us. In a way, a child likes to hear the stories. And he knew, may Allah grant him blessings and reward him, that there are so many other fake heroes around us, the youngsters. You watch Hollywood, you watch Marvel, you watch uh, you know, all those other Hollywood, and they, and they give you these other heroes, Spider-Man, Superman, and so on and so forth. And before I could take those as my heroes... My father made sure to give me the real heroes and their stories in detail. As a child, I took them as my role models. And no matter what happened at school, I would got bullied. <laughs> I got isolated sometimes. I would remember the stories of the companions. They were real and they got bullied sometimes. They got hurt sometimes, but they stood up with their identity. They may lose sometimes in a, in a fight. They may win sometimes. And it's the character of people. We, we, we naturally, if somebody beats us, we think that we need to copy them now. They're like the strong ones. But no. In Islam, we learned the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, when they fell, they got up again. No one kept them down. And they knew who they were. And their moral role models, Muhammad ﷺ. They were true heroes and warriors in every sense of the word. Wallah. And every time I remembered them, I'd say, I want to be with them. I'm like them, inshallah. They are my role models. Unfortunately, today we hear less and less of the companions. And our children, they got these fake heroes who are just an imaginary figure. And through them, some of our children learn certain things, certain agendas through them. So we need to warn and teach our children. Nothing wrong with watching Superman, but to teach our children that we have our super men and super women, mashaAllah, and they are the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu who stood up for real morals and the truth. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in the Quran, "Min al-mu'minin rijalun sadaqu ma 'ahadu Allah 'alayhi fa minhum man qada nahbahu wa minhum man yantadhir." وَمَا بَدَّلُوا تَبْدِيلًا Allah says, among the believers are, there are those who have remained true to the covenant they made with Allah. They were true to their promise that they made to Allah. Among those, some of them have fulfilled their vow and others await the appointed time. Some of them still have not come. They have not changed in the least. When they made a promise to Allah, they stuck to their promise and they never wavered and became hypocritical. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told us those who you those among you who live after me will see great disagreement. You must then follow my sunnah and that of the rightly guided caliphs. Hold to it and stick strongly to it. Avoid novelties, for every novelty is an innovation and every innovation is an error. By Sunan Abu Dawood, in English translation, book 41, hadith number 4590. For those who ask for sources. The first rightly guided Khalifa, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, we spoke last week that when he was a child, he tested the idols. He came one day and said, feed me. But they wouldn't feed him. He said, how can I worship a God that cannot feed me or feed him itself. Another time he threw a rock at one of them. He was a teenager and threw a rock. It made a chip in one of the idols. And he said, how can a God protect me when it couldn't protect itself? And so Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, like the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he never worshipped idols. Number two, when he was a child, he saw a drunk man. 
and this drunk man saw feces on the floor. He picked up the feces and began to put it and smudge it on his face and on his body. And then the young Abu Bakr said, Ew, I will never touch that stuff. So he never drank wine or alcohol in his life. And that is the same as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is a very similar characteristic to the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. And so Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was a monotheist. He always worshipped one God and never drank wine and got drunk. By the way, brothers and sisters, that society, Quraysh and the Arabs, they always, they did know there is one God. They worship the supreme one God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they called him Allah. In fact, Arab Christian, Arab uh, Jews, Arab. Any Arab would call God Allah in Arabic. Allah is not just specific to the Muslims. Allah means the one true God. The Arabs in those times, before Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they worshipped one God. However, the problem was that they made partners with him. They assigned different gods of different, you know, um, uh, abilities. It's like demigods. And then gave them names other than Allah. Not one of these idols was called Allah. Because the only Allah was the one true God. They, they knew that. But they used to say, these demigods, we only worship them to bring us closer to the real God. So they made them into intermediaries. They called some of their gods Hubal, for example, Uzza, Lat, and many other names. Okay, they wanted something to see. So this is what the problem was with the people of Quraysh or the Arabs. The early life, we begin with Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu with his conversion. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam received for the first time the words from Jibreel alayhi salam in the cave of Hira, as you all know the story. And the first one to believe in him was his wife Khadija radiallahu anha. We all know the famous story when he bl she blanketed him and while he was shivering a bit confused about himself and afraid seeing what he saw and hearing what he heard. And she said to him, Wallahi, Allah will not let you go lost, O Muhammad, for you feed the hungry, you free the slave, you look after the orphans, you care for the widows, you look after the destitute. You unite between people who are in conflict. You unite between families. And so on. After Khadija radiallahu anha helped him, his wife, and he calmed down, the first person he went to tell in secret about this, he can't just go to anyone. Anyone he tells will think he's a crazy person. He's got to tell the one he trusts the most and will give him support. Who was it after his wife? None other than Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. For he was the Prophet sallallahu friend from when they were babies, little tiny children, two, three, four years old. He was raised with him. And he had seen how the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi was always trustworthy and honest at a close distance. He had always heard from the Prophet, peace be upon him, little words and sayings that Abu Bakr used to think are beyond a human. You know, he's seeing, hearing things. He said, this is a kind of like a prophet, Abu Bakr used to think. So it wasn't hard for him to believe him when the Prophet ﷺ came to him and said, Ya Abu Bakr, don't tell anyone. I have received news and words from God, from above the heavens, by an angel, Jibreel. And I have been chosen by Allah that I am his messenger and prophet. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, without hesitating, without stuttering, without even thinking about it for a millisecond, said, I believe you, O messenger of Allah. Immediately he called him the messenger of Allah. I believe you, O messenger of Allah. And that is why the Prophet wasallam used to say, every single person stuttered and waited and thought and went back and forth and even went against me and said I was a liar in the beginning. Except for Abu Bakr, wallahi, he did not hesitate nor stutter. As soon as I told him I'm the messenger of Allah, he said, Sadaqta ya Rasulullah. You are honest and truthful, O messenger of Allah. And so he was called as siddiq He believed him that someone, a spirit, used to come down from the skies 
and speak to this man Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He believed in him that God's words came down to him, words of Allah, and only he heard them. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And so there came a time when Islam was starting to sort of show and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was making tawaf. One day he was circumambulating around the Kaaba. And there was a man whom they used to call Abu al-Hakam, Amr ibn Hisham, Abu al-Hakam, the man of wisdom. He was one of the great, one of the important leaders of Quraysh and respected. The Prophet ﷺ ended up calling him Abu Jahl, the man of ignorance, because he was the worst against the Prophet and the Muslims and he conspired the most. One day, Abu Jahl saw the Prophet ﷺ circumambulating and he had heard the secret of what he's saying, that he is a prophet, a messenger. And they were afraid of this messenger destroying the fabric of their society. Their society was based on oppression, wrongfulness, and they had racism in there. They had slavery and mistreated their slaves. The women had no rights. They took people's money by worshipping the idols. They extorted people. They were full of oppression. So what did they do? They went to try to stop Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But a man by the name of Ibn al-Alqami, he was a wicked man. You know, when somebody is honorable and doesn't want to look bad, they send, their, they send you know, people to do their dirty work. Ibn al-Alqami, that was his name. He was the guy they used to choose to do their dirty work. And he went to the Prophet ﷺ as he was circumambulating. And then he, when the Prophet ﷺ sat down to make sajda in front of the Kaaba, Ibn al-Alqami waited for him to get up. And then he placed his clothing, uh, a piece of clothing around the Prophet Sallallahu neck and began to strangle the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi pulling him towards him. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu saw this and nobody knew that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu had become a Muslim yet. He ran to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and protected him with his own might and his own body. And said to them, أَتَقْتُلُونَ رَجُلًا أَنْ يَقُولَ رَبِّيَ اللَّهِ Do you want to kill a man just because he says, My Lord is Allah? Subhanallah. And that was the first chivalry of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, the first man to protect the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a situation against the tyrant rulers without any fear. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu went immediately and he began to preach Islam to all the people he knew, the most important people. Among them were five of the best of Quraysh. What were their names? Their names were Uthman radiallahu anhu, Az-Zubayr radiallahu anhu, very strong man, Az-Zubayr. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, very respectable, highly respectable man. Talha radiallahu anhu, highly respectable man. And Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, an entrepreneur of the highest esteem among the Quraysh. They immediately believed Abu Bakr because they knew he was also trustworthy and honest. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu then began to go around and do what he does best. What did he do? He used to, because he was so full of compassion, he used to liberate slaves. At the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa even in, in, during Islam and before, people used to be slaves. And this is the way the world worked. Slavery came from all different colors and backgrounds. But among them was the great Bilal radiallahu anhu. As soon as Abu Bakr anhu became a Muslim, he went immediately and within that week or so, he freed 10 slaves. We all know the story of Bilal radiallahu anhu. He saw him being dragged in the deserts and placed in the heat of the sun in the middle of the day while the sun was burning Bilal radiallahu anhu's body. And we all know the story when his master when his uh, master put the big stone, the big boulder onto his chest and began to whip him in the sun and say to him, leave this religion. And he would say, Ahadun Ahad. There is only one God, only one God. When Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu came and said to him, to his master, he said, why are you so cruel to this poor man? Trying to reach out to his conscience. And he said, 
Umayya, his name was. Abu Bakr, if you feel for him, then why don't you buy him? Obviously, he wanted him off, his, off himself because Bilal was proving how people can be liberated from their masters. They can believe what they want to believe. And he was about to die on that and his master wanted to get rid of him. He says, why don't you buy him? And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu bought him. We don't know exactly for how much. Some say it was 40 silver coins. Others, they say it was nine or seven silver coins. And others, they say he exchanged him for another slave. I know you have this famous story about, I don't know what, but as I told you, I want to bring you the authentic stories that I can rely on, inshallah. Bilal radiallahu anhu, also, uh, Umar Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he offered Umayyah so much money, and Umayyah said, if you think you've done good, by buying him for this much, I would have sold him for much less. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, Wallahi, I would have bought him for any price you wanted. Any price. And this shows us, my dear brothers and sisters, how in Islam, there is no one superior to the other. You are not respected because of how much money you have, or what color you have, or what background you come from, or whether you are a man or a woman, a male or a female. You are not respected because of your fame and your fortune or your lineage or your job. In Islam, in the eyes of Allah, everyone is equal. There is no difference between an Arab, the Prophet ﷺ said, and a foreign, a non-Arab. The Arabs, obviously, anyone who's non-Arab, they call them a foreigner, meaning non-Arab. Except in piety and taqwa. إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ The most honored among you to Allah are the ones who are most righteous and God-fearing. Allah watches all things. So in Islam, there is no nationalism. There is no racism. There is none of that. Yes, you like your nation, but Allah, there's no one superior above another because of where you come from. And such was Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu with Bilal radiallahu anhu. It doesn't matter how much you ask, he liberated him bi'ithnillah, and Bilal became the mu'addin. My name is Bilal. I wish I was a fingernail on the hand or even foot of Bilal, the Ethiopian radiallahu anhu. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu then freed, bought and freed his mother, Bilal's mother. Her name was Hamama. And another name, Zanira. And these names, brothers and sisters, they were nobodies, absolute nobodies among the people of the Arabs. Nobodies. Fahira, Ummu Abs, Nahdiya, and her daughter, a slave of Bani Adi. She was uh, among Umar radiallahu anhu's clan, whom Umar used to torture and punish. And that's why Abu Bakr was named Al-Atiq, which means the freer of slaves, the liberator. That's the name that Abu Bakr received, the liberator. And as you can see, all these names I mentioned, you don't know them. But if you knew their lives, they were literally absolute nobodies to the non-Muslims of Arabia. So much so that Abu Bakr father, Abu Quhafa, this was before he became Muslim, he used to come up to Abu Bakr and say, What's this? Ya Abu Bakr, you're using your money and wasting it, throwing it away and burning it on these nobodies. If you want to free some slaves, go and free you know, important people. They can at least help you and support you. All you are freeing is people like Zanaira and I don't know what, who are nobodies. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu used to just smile to his father. His father had a bit of a, a tough uh, sort of character. And Abu Bakr al used to say, it is Islam, my dear father. Islam is the thing that honors the person. I do not look at people based on their color or their status in society. And such is the way that the Islam taught us, my dear brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters, look around you here in the masjid. How many colors do you see? How many ethnicities do you see? Wallahi, how do we stand in our salat? Does it matter what color we are? Does it matter where we come from? How rich we are or not with wealth, to Allah we are equal and we should never differentiate. We should never discriminate. We are equal. And the only reason why our sisters stand in the back rows is out of respect for them and their dignity and their privacy, not because they are lesser than us. Don't ever get that wrong. We don't call each other names. We don't demean each other, even jokingly. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he forbid us from joking in this way. He forbid us 
from calling each other's name, each other names, as in the Quran, ولا تنابزوا بالألقاب. Don't call each other demeaning names. Subhanallah. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in his last sermon, he said, "Avoid and abandon racism, for it is a stinking carcass on the side of the road. It brings no good, except disunity and enmity between you." My dear brothers and sisters. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, after three years of keeping Islam secret, he decides to suddenly come out one day and make it public. There were only 36 Muslims within three years after the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came out as a prophet. Only 36 because of the enmity that people had. But Abu Bakr, he decides to come out in public. Yeah, he couldn't handle it anymore. So the Prophet Sallallahu said to him, Ya Abu Bakr, don't go out right now. Wallahi, I have no power to protect you right now. With only 36 Muslims. Don't make it public. Keep it private. But Abu Bakr anhu, said, Ya Rasulullah, are you commanding me or are you just advising me? He said, I'm advising you. He said, let me go in public and see what happens. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu went out. And he stood in front of the Kaaba and begins to give a khutbah, a sermon about Islam. Among all these leaders who are ready to kill the Prophet ﷺ. Among them was a man named Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. He sees Abu Bakr anhu giving the khutbah about Islam. And he begins to beat him so severely. And he called all his children and all the young men around the Kaaba. They ganged on Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and began to beat him almost to death. He went unconscious and when, they, and when his clan came and carried him away, they brought him to his house. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu's face and his back, the back of his head, could not be distinguished. You didn't know from the amount of blood which one was his face, which one was the back of his head radiallahu anhu. And he was unconscious, and he woke up in his house. He just found himself in his house, subhanAllah. And he found his father and his mother around him. And what do you think the first thing Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said? He asked, is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam safe and sound? Is the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam safe and sound? That was his first words after he regained consciousness. How is my beloved Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? His mother, Umm al-Khayr, she said, Oh, Abu Bakr, look at your state and you're sitting here asking about Muhammad. We're looking after you. You, ne you nearly died. He said, call for me Bintu al-Khattab. There was a girl named Fatima, a woman named Fatima, the daughter of Al-Khattab. She was the sister of Umar radiallahu anhu. She had embraced Islam in secret. Nobody knew, but Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu knew. He said, call me Bint Al-Khattab. So they called her. And he asked her while his mother was there. He said, how is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? How is the messenger of Allah? And Umm Al-Khattab looked at his mother. Because his mother hadn't embraced Islam yet. She's afraid. And he said, don't worry about my mother. She's all right. She's kind. Tell me. Tell me about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And she said, he is alive and well and safe. He said, Wallahi, I cannot rest until you take me to him. I want to see him with my eyes. He can't even walk. I want to see him with my eyes. So they took him. He saw him. And he said, Ya Rasulallah, you are okay. Fidaka abi wa ummi, Ya Rasulallah. And Abu Bakr Dawan said, I would ransom myself. For you, before I would ransom myself for my own parents, O Messenger of Allah. And so the statement, this fidaka abi wa ummi, became a, a thing, a habit on all the tongues of the companions after Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Fidaka abi wa ummi, ya Rasulallah. And we all say, fidaka abi, fidaka abi wa ummi, ya Rasulallah. We would ransom ourselves for you, O Messenger of Allah, to free you, before we would ransom for our own parents, for he is the messenger of Allah who came to take us out of darkness into light. And it is because of him that on the day of judgment, by the will of Allah, the ummah, the Muslims will be saved when he will say, Oh my Lord, save my ummah, my ummah. 
When parents will run away from their children, the children run away from their parents. La ilaha illallah. He is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As Allah says, rahmatan lil alameen. A mercy to all mankind. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was such. There was a time when the migration to Abyssinia happened. Do you remember the, first, the story of the first migration? The Muslims were being persecuted so severely. And the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave permission for the Prophet sallallahu to give permission to some Muslims to migrate, to leave their homes from Mecca and go to a safe place. The place that they were going to was Ethiopia, which was ruled by a Christian king who's... Uh, the Abyssinian king, and he was a just and fair ruler. It doesn't matter if he was a Christian. What mattered is that he led and ruled in justice and fairness. And the Prophet ﷺ said to his companions, Go to Abyssinia, for it is ruled by a fair, just, and kind king. And this is what really matters, brothers and sisters, for the great Ibn Taymiyyah and many other scholars like him. They said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will assist and support a government, a country, an, an empire, a ruling, which is led upon justice and fairness, even if it was a non-Muslim government. But he will not assist a government or a rule which is governed by oppression and its laws are unfair to the people, even if that ruling, even if that government was a Muslim government. So what really matters? That a rule is just and fair to the people. It gives them their rights. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Go to this just ruler in Ethiopia, for nobody is treated unjustly under him. Abu Bakr was among those who wanted to migrate to Abyssinia. As he was going... A man by the name of Ibn al-Daghina. Ibn al-Daghina. Ibn al-Daghina was a non-Muslim, but he was an honorable, respectable old man. And he was wealthy with money. When he saw Abu Bakr migrating with them, he became sad. And he said, Ya Abu Bakr, you, the noble, the noble, respected Abu Bakr, has to run away from his own homeland? No, I will not allow it. It was a custom among the Arabs that if you go out in public and say to everybody, so-and-so is under my protection, nobody is allowed to harm that person. That was an Arab custom. So the Arabs had some good things about them. Ibn al-Daghina went to the Kaaba and he took Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and he said to the people of Mecca, I... I will take, uh, he said to people of Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr is under my protection. For he helps the poor, he is kind to those in trouble, and he was so nice if you go to him as a guest. And so, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was under his protection for a while. However, the Meccans came to this man, Ibn al-Daghina, and they said to him, listen, we will not harm him on one condition. He is not allowed to talk about his religion in public. Tell him to be quiet and keep it inside his house. He said, okay. Because as soon as he talks in public, your protection is over. He said, fine. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu then went one, one night. He was in his house and he was praying in the night. This was before the five daily prayers came down. And he started to recite some Quran. And he, he, he recited the Quran a little bit loud. So whoever was passing in front of his house, they could hear him. The houses in those days weren't like ours. You know, if you're just a few meters close, you can hear people talking inside. So he, he was reciting Al-Fatiha. And then one non-Muslim heard him, went and reported him to Abu Jahl. They came back to Ibn al and they said, what's this? You break the treaty. Your mate, Abu Bakr, is reciting the Quran. We don't want to hear this stuff. So he went to Abu Bakr and said, Abu Bakr, I can't protect you anymore. You have to stop this. He goes, I won't stop reading the Quran in my own house. He said, well, then I can't protect you anymore. So Abu Bakr said to him, doesn't matter. Thank you for trying. Allah will protect me. He is enough. Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Allah is enough and he is the best to rely on. So he missed out on the migration and now he is like the Prophet Muhammad sallam, sitting in Mecca 
also a, almost like a fugitive. You don't know what's going to happen to him. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, time had passed and he took part in the opening public uh, announcement of Islam and so on. Until one day, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu received the news from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that they are allowed to migrate from Mecca and go to their new home, Medina. You all know the story of the migration, right? Al-Hijrah. And some Muslims were migrating from Mecca going to Medina. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he wanted to go with them. He was hastening. He wanted to go to Medina and make sure to set it up for the Prophet sallallahu to come. But the Prophet sallallahu came up to Abu Bakr and said to him, not now, ya Abu Bakr. Not yet. Just wait. Abu Bakr radiallahu was confused. He didn't know, but he just obeyed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. One year passed, two years passed. Abu Bakr radiallahu wants to go. Every time he wants to go, Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will say to him, Ya Abu Bakr, not yet. Allah may have chosen for you a companion so you don't go by yourself. See, Abu Bakr wanted to migrate by himself on his own camel. And the Prophet would just give him a hint. He would say, Allah may have chosen for you a companion. Don't travel alone. Now, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he's thinking all this time, who is this companion the Prophet's talking about? Who is this companion that Allah's going to choose? You know, all right, I won't go alone, but who is it? He never thought it would be the Prophet sallallahu himself who will be his companion. Now, listen to this. Aisha radiallahu anha herself, she is the daughter of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. She narrates this full story. She says, one day, in the middle of the day, when it was Dhuhr time, and Dhuhr, everybody goes inside the house and goes to sleep. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, she said, he came and knocked on our door, very lightly and very secretly. My father opened for him the door, and the Prophet immediately said to him, Akhrij man indak, whoever's inside your house, get him to leave. He said, Ya Rasulullah, it's only your family. Yani, we are your family. I only have my wife and my daughter Aisha and my other daughter Asma. And they are your family and they, they, they'll protect you. Their, their life is yours. He said, Ya Abu Bakr, let me in. He comes inside, says, close the door, don't let anybody hear. He said to him, Allah has given me permission to migrate. You're asking, why would he want to say that? Because no messenger of God, the prophets are not allowed to leave their people until Allah gives them permission. Remember the story of Jonah, Yunus alayhi salam, when he left without Allah giving him permission and the big fish swallowed him? Well, the prophet Muhammad alayhi couldn't leave. And then he said to him, Allah has given me permission to migrate. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu replied, Ya Rasulullah, and a smile began to develop on Abu Bakr's face. He tried to hold himself together and not say it too loud. He said, Ya Rasulullah, are you saying it is my companionship? Are you saying it is my companionship? Are you going to be my companion? Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to think about this. The messenger of Allah, nobody, nobody he traveled with, Nobody traveled with him. The person whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will choose to be the Prophet's companion on this trip will be the most honorable. He is chosen by Allah. This came from above seven heavens. He said, as Ya Rasulullah, are you going to be my companion? And the Prophet ﷺ smiled to him and said, Yes, Ya Abu Bakr, it is your companionship. It is your companionship. You will be my companion. Aisha radiallahu anha said, Wallahi, I had never seen a man cry in my life. Aisha says, I have never seen a man cry in my life until that day when I saw my father, Abu Bakr, crying so heavily like a little child out of happiness and joy. Subhanallah. My father had prepared two strong bull camels, she said. And the Prophet said, no, I will not take one of your bull camels until I pay for it. He wanted to pay for the camel. Abu Bakr wanted to give it to him for free. 
But the Prophet ﷺ said, no, I will not go with you until I pay for it. And when Abu Bakr knew that the Prophet ﷺ insisted, he took its price. Do you know why the Prophet ﷺ insisted on paying for the camel? Does anyone know why? This is called the Hijrah. This is called the Great Migration. This is what changed the history of Islam, brothers and sisters. This was the act which is more significant than any act in the world. The migration, the hijrah, for which Allah mentioned in the Quran, which is the only thing above jihad itself, above fighting and dying in the cause of Allah. The hijrah. Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wanted the reward of the hijrah. Do you know what the hijrah is? That was the hijrah. Anyone who migrated on that time and died along the way goes to paradise without any punishment and without any accountability. He is a muhajir. A muhajir, a migrant. Rasul Sallallahu wanted the rewards of the hijrah himself by taking a camel. He hasn't really shared in the full rewards, so he participated by giving donating and giving and sacrificing from his wealth for his own camel. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu understood this and he sold it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Bakr got a guide and to get his camels ready and to show them the way and to prepare the cave of Thawr, a secret cave for them to hide in for three nights. Only Ali radiyallahu anhu, Ali, the first cousin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Aisha radiyallahu anha, Asma radiyallahu anha, and Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu were the only ones who knew about the Prophet's migration and when they, where they were hiding. Why? Because the enemies wanted to kill him. So he had to be decisive. Brothers and sisters, let me just stop here quickly. There is no such thing in Islam as just relying on God to protect you without you doing your part. Tawakkul on Allah is not for free, just like that. You have to do and take into account the actions of cause and effect. You need to plan. A Muslim plans. A Muslim, a Muslim prepares. A Muslim, they make strategies. A Muslim gains experience. A Muslim gains help. A Muslim does not just sit there and does things haphazardly. They do it with knowledge, skill, experience, and they plan. They plan before they act. They plan before they act. Because I hear a lot of Muslims these days don't plan, they just jump. You have to do tawakkul, you have to plan. And so this was the state of the Prophet Wasallam and Abu Bakr right up to this point. Does anyone realize something that's developing here or not? What is Abu Bakr anhu doing here? Who is the closest to the Prophet ﷺ? Abu Bakr. Who is accompanying the Prophet ﷺ in the hardest times? Abu Bakr. Who is protecting him in the hardest times? Abu Bakr. Whom is the Prophet ﷺ sharing his secrets with? Abu Bakr anhu. Who is the first to become a Muslim among the men? Abu Bakr anhu. Brothers and sisters, as they traveled down the desert and hid inside the cave of Thawr, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu raced the Prophet sallallahu into the cave. And he started to rip parts of his clothing and cover all the little holes in the cave. Do you know why? In case there's any scorpions or snakes that come out. And there was one more hole left, which Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu could not have enough of his clothes to hide. So he covered it with his own heel, with his own foot. Now there is a little story that we all know, that when they arrived at Thawr, there was a, a spider that made a cobweb and covered the entrance of the cave in order to show the people that if they come and find the cave, they know, oh, there's no one in there because otherwise the cobweb would have been broken. And the story also tells us that there was a pigeon that immediately came and built its nest after the Prophet entered the cave. And it also laid eggs. So the people who come and find the cave, they'll think, well, if there was someone who entered the cave, this pigeon wouldn't just stay here, it would have flown away. These two stories, my dear brothers and sisters, are not entirely authentic. Even Abu Bakr al-Anhu's putting his whole, his, his, uh, 
uh, heel in the hole of the cave. And there is a story that a snake came and bit it. And as the Prophet ﷺ's cheek was lying on the lap of Abu Bakr anhu, he was asleep. Abu Bakr anhu felt the pain of the snake. And from the pain, he tried not to say anything so he doesn't wake up the Prophet ﷺ. But instead, his tears fell down from the pain onto the cheek of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet woke up and asked him, what is the matter, ya Abu Bakr? And then he told him, the snake bit me, ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet ﷺ wiped some of his saliva on his heel. And he recited, I think, Al-Fatiha or something. And Abu Bakr was healed from the poison of the snake. These three stories, my dear brothers and sisters, the first one about the snake is a weak narration. I have to tell you, Allahu A'lam, if it's authentic. As for the spider web, there is a difference of opinion about its authenticity. Sheikh Al-Albani said it is weak. And however, Ibn Hajar and Ibn Kathir, they said it has a sound narration. Maybe, maybe the cobweb is true. And the pigeon and the laying of the eggs, well, actually, there is no, no narration about it. <laughs> There's no, we don't know where it came from. So maybe the historians talked about it. As I told you, brothers and sisters, I will bring you what I think, inshallah, and what I am sure of, well, what I can rely on, inshallah, with information. My dear brothers and sisters, there is only, and I'll finish it with this. However, Abu Jahl and the Quraysh leaders, they came looking for the Prophet, sallallahu and Abu Bakr. And when they reached the cave of Thawr, they stood above it and they looked around. And the cave sort of like goes beneath your feet. So you've got, you got to look down towards it if you stand up. Abu Jahl kept on looking and the Quraysh. And then they returned. Now looking right back at them in the cave was Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, Wallahi, if Abu Jahl just looked downwards, he would have seen my eyes looking at him, staring at him. But we are safe. For Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then said to him, O oh Abu Bakr, la takhaf, do not fear, for Allah is with us. Inna Allah ma'ana. Allah is with us. What if I told you, ya Abu Bakr, of two companions, whom Allah is their third companion with them? A rhetoric question. This was when Jibreel alayhi salam had just revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the following verse from Surah At-Tawbah, chapter 9, verse 40. And I'll finish our talk today with this. Allah says, إِذْ هُمَا فِي الْغَارِ إِذْ يَقُولُ لِصَاحِبِهِ لَا تَحْزَنْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَنَا فَأَنْزَلَ اللَّهُ سَكِينَتَهُ عَلَيْهِ وَأَيَّدَهُ بِجُنُودٍ لَمْ تَرَوْهَا وَجَعَلَ كَلِمَةَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا السُّفْلَى وَكَلِمَةُ اللَّهِ هِيَ الْعُلْيَا وَاللَّهُ عَزِيزٌ حَكِيمٌ It will matter little if you do not help the Prophet. For Allah surely helped him when the unbelievers drove him out of his home. And he was but one of the two when they were in the cave. And when he said to his companion, do not grieve, Allah is with us. Then Allah caused his tranquility to descend upon them and supported him with hosts you did not see. He humbled the word of the unbelievers. As for Allah's word, it is inherently uppermost. Allah is all-powerful, all-wise. My dear brothers and sisters, this particular verse right there, is an indication for us, the strongest indication, to show the future that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was about to lead, to be the first Khalifa after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his successor, whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept giving hints about without directly mentioning his name. My brothers and sisters, Aisha time has arrived. Insha'Allah next week, we will move on to talk about Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu's life in Medina, and it's going to get a bit more uh, interesting and involving and dramatic. We're going to talk a little bit about his uh, how he involved himself with the 
family, the disputes of the Prophet ﷺ within his family. He will talk about some things that happened around the Prophet ﷺ. And we will see some more of the Abu Bakr's character, real personality come out. And then inshallah we'll talk about how he was elected as Khalifa. Uh, next week will also be a bit emotional. We talk about the death of the Prophet ﷺ and the role of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. هذا وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك